personal happiness, which is one of our core values. Anytime like I have to have a very difficult conversation with someone, I don't want to have this conversation. Remember our core value, personal happiness? Well, when you don't complete your job, when you slack off, when you drop the ball, it affects my own personal happiness. And when you can reflect it back on a core value like that, people will be like, oh shoot, like I never thought of it like that. After I have one of those conversations, I never have one again. Clicks right away. It's actually pretty incredible. Welcome back to the 4Media Uncut Podcast. Today we have a very, very special guest, Joshua Johnston, aka Joshi Kobayashi on Instagram. Josh is an amazing, amazing person in the e-com and advertising and marketing space. He was the CEO of one of the biggest content agencies in the space for multiple years. And now he's running his own operations with 321 Pocket Ops, uh, doing consulting with some of the largest agencies in the e-com space, rubbing shoulders with some of the biggest names you've definitely heard of. And he's actually speaking at the AdWorld conference this year. Big, big stuff. He is actually, uh, he f he drove here all the way from where? Frank Tennessee? Franklin, Tennessee? Yeah, Nashville, he, Tennessee. He, yeah, Nashville. He came in just for this podcast and to check out the 4Media studio. And uh, he's honored to be uh, one of the first guests. So without any further ado, check out this episode, Joshua Johnson. Thank you so much for driving down. This man actually drove four hours uh, to get here from Nashville, Tennessee. We got Mr. Joshua Johnson, one of the biggest Woo! names in the e-commerce space. <laughs> one of the biggest. Wow. <laughs> He's, he, I love that. Not the biggest guy, but, you know, the biggest name. Yeah. You know, biggest all, name. All five, six of me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. 100%. Short Kings <laughs> Unite. <laughs> so uh, before we jump in, you know, I love um, when people kind of have a background from the person themselves rather than just an introduction of us hyping you up. So 100%. Could you kind of give us a background, not just like professional career wise, but life, you know, yeah. like where are you from? What have you done? 100%. You know, what sports have you played? What made you who you are? Sweet. Yeah, man. Going way back. I love it. So, uh, was born and raised in like Ann Arbor, Michigan. So just outside oh, of nice. Detroit and, uh, had a, uh, a great experience growing up in like, uh, the east side of Michigan. Absolutely loved growing up there. Uh, very athletic area actually got a lot of great football players basketball players coming out of there so sports was always super competitive for me growing up and had the opportunity to play a lot of high school sports got injured after playing some high school sports so didn't get to play in college what injury uh i had a hyperextended uh, patellar tendon yeah. which is where uh on your knee oh yeah. Mm. yeah yeah so it was a bummer i had tendonitis for probably like two and a half years uh, after that, but then got into like exercise. And so that's what kind of transitioned me into my college route, which was exercise science. So I actually have my degree in exercise science. So absolutely nothing to do with marketing or business. <laughs> um, but had a really cool opportunity after I graduated from Grand Valley State University, which is on the west side of Michigan, to work for a CEO. His name is Matt Wilbur. Uh, and he owned the largest fit body boot camp uh, franchise in the United States and fastest growing. He had f four facilities. Doing How old were you here? I was 20, probably 23 at the time. So post-college? Yeah, post-college, 23. You graduated college? I did graduate. With the exercise? Yep. In the, okay, yep. Gotcha. yep, 100%. And then uh, worked under him for a, a very long time um, and had the opportunity to uh, essentially see his business grow. He had four facilities that were doing about a million dollars a year in revenue and like in the fitness industry, that's pretty, that's pretty crazy. And then he had, I think, uh, another three that were doing like at least half a mil. Uh, and so watching that, I was like, okay, when I started here, there was 12 employees. Uh, and so I quickly moved up the ladder there. And by the time, like I was about to exit, we had about 50 employees. And so it was like a three year window that we were, that I was working there. And it just got like my mind turning of like, okay, how are we hitting scale so fast? It like really like kind of launched me into like this like entrepreneur mindset, this growth mindset of like, how, how are we doing this? How are we scaling? And so essentially he invested very heavily into me, giving me anything from scaling books to read, business books, operations, like all of these things. That's where I kind of got my start into the operations route. And so I uh, had the opportunity to work on him for a while and then had the opportunity to go work at Welling Media um, shortly after that. And so that was a really cool opportunity. Saw a ton of growth, 
within that position. Um, for Lauren, people that don't know, uh, can you give a rundown of Welling? Yeah, yeah, 100%. So Welling Media is a digital marketing agency out of Nashville, Tennessee, um, primarily known for like their content creation, their content department. They have about 20, a 25 person content team. And uh, uh, we were able to scale that from just, uh, when I came on board, it was me and the CEO, Chandler Welling. And we were able to scale that from zero people all the way up to 25 people. And then underwent an acquisition back in December. Uh, and yeah, it was crazy fast movement. It was like two and a half years. We were able to grow and scale that, that business. And, uh, man, like a ton of like just life and learning lessons from that business lessons. Um, it, it's funny, like when you, uh, kind of exit away from a company, cause after the, the acquisition just, uh, made a decision to transition out of the, the business and start my own, uh, man, like you kind of like see things from a 30,000 foot view and you're like, man, there's so many things that I could have done, but you actually learn more seeing it from the outside than actually being in it every day. So, and that's kind of where we are today. Uh, started my own venture about seven months ago, uh, 321 Pocket Ops. And uh, yeah, we do consulting for digital marketing agencies, specifically on uh, some business tactics and then also operations. So combination of that, it's been, it's been a ton of fun so far. So when you go into businesses in general, I know, I feel like I know what your answer to this is because of how you, you know, treated it. Cause just a background for everyone here, we actually paid Josh millions. a lot of money yeah, millions to be of, here yeah, millions today. Of dollars, actually. Yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like tens of millions, but you know, a few million <laughs> single uh, digit millions. Yeah. But we, we, we paid Josh for a weekend of consulting, um, back in July. Um, and then we, ironically, um, so July of last year, July, July 2020, yeah. Yeah, July so 2020. a year ago. So we're filming this in July, 2021. Wow. Uh, Wowzers. so actually exactly a year from like two days ago, we it were, it feels like it was two years ago, right? It does. Um, but exactly a year ago we were in your office, we were talking and on the same drive that you just took the exact same one, four hours, we called our realtor and we said, we want an office and we walked into this exact office at the end of that trip at 7 30 PM. And we decided we're going to get an office instead of being a remote team. And so that That's was really cool. Kind of the transition. So we signed the lease a month after that late August and then moved in October, end of October. Actually in October, when Andrew first came here, we, it was a plain office with like eight office chairs in the middle of the room without a desk. <laughs> like just it's flying. wild. Uh, it, it's crazy because like when we had our first interview or whatever you want to call it, first talks about me coming onto the team, uh, like one or two of the desks were built. The conference table wasn't built and it was literally just us sitting in the office in a couple of office chairs that had been built with a case of water bottles in the corner. <laughs> and then he was like, want a water bottle? That's They're not awesome. cold, but like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like it was perfect. Cause it was so cool. And, uh, we didn't even have this side of the space yeah. at all is, is it's wild to see how much has happened in l less than a year. Yeah. That's so funny. Cause when we started at the agency, uh, it was just, it was just two of us and we had, um, I don't know, like a thousand square foot warehouse that we were working out of. And we only had the chairs uh, and we used the boxes from the chairs as our desks. And we set up like <laughs> these cardboard desks that we could work on with our chairs until our desks finally came like a week later. That's uh, crazy. But yeah. It's weird meetings. how you take for granted like office furniture. Like office furniture actually is so expensive. And oh like my you don't think about like a desk. Yeah. Like you need a desk to be productive. You if we sold all the chair. furniture in here, we'd buy a brand new house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's just so much actually. And like. It's crazy. But so I, I, I prefaced with that to say, uh, well, one, let's go back to my original question. When you go into a business, what's the first thing that you look for? Cause there's, when we went to visit you in Nashville, mm. we're like strategy numbers. What are you doing? What are your tactics? How are you shooting? Like we're looking very, you know, on the ground and yeah. you were looking very in the sky. Uh -huh. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what, what is the one thing you feel like most businesses lack, I guess, when you yeah. go into them? I think, I think most businesses lack an end game and that's what I tend to look for when I first step into like a consulting role with a company is like, okay, like, where do you want to go with this department or with the entire company And nine out of 10 times people have no clue. And so without mm -hmm. an end game actually put into place, uh, like you can't reverse engineer it and, and see where you want to go. Like, you know, people always say like, oh, I want to do a million dollars. And it's like, okay, like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know? And so, uh, 
a lot of times we'll go and we'll strategize on end game and vision and, and lay some foundation for why is it that they actually started a company? Because uh, I think a lot of people can't answer that question uh, when it mm-hmm. comes to why they why they started their entrepreneurial journey. And so that's what we start on, um, and then we kind of build from there. What is the answer that most people give of why they started? Um, <laughs> get rich uh, or uh, <laughs> and, and, get and that, rich or die trying. Yeah, and and that's something that I've been talking with a lot of businesses about is like like an internal and an external goal for like either your clients for yourself or you kind of like a higher purpose, whether that's like a, a an aspirational thing that you want to do for like a charity or, or whatever it is. Like uh, I think that you have to have multiple end games and multiple visions for your company because people at the end of the day are driven by different things. Like not everyone is going to be driven by money within your organization. And so you need to have things that will allow you to push the ball forward with, with employees inside your business that are not driven by money because you will have those people and those people are crucial to your organization. And then you have people, you know, like your sales team that are 100% driven by money. It's like, yeah, like, let me eat. And it's like, you got to be able to feed those people. So uh, I think it's important to have both of those pieces kind of built in for people that are driven by money and then also people that are driven by more like charitable type yeah. vision. It's funny, um, in our interviews recently, and I got this from James uh, Shaq's business partner in Geek oh, Out, yeah. um, but I've been asking people, what if I couldn't pay you in money, what would you want to be paid in? And there's answers all over the place, cars, yeah. real estate, all this stuff, but the best candidates always answer the same one. Can you guess what it is? Gratitude. Nope. You want to guess, Andrew? I know the answer, but uh, you know the answer. What is it? Uh, it was well. Do you want me to say it? Yeah. It was knowledge. Knowledge. Shane paid in knowledge. Yeah. Got knowledge. It. Knowledge. I All love right. that. All right, Ty Lopez. Um, <laughs> no, I, it, it's cool to think because, like, for for those that know me, I was in a job in Lifetime Fitness, and I was the number one guy in the company. Like, honestly, no questions from a sales side. I was always at the top of the list. Mm-hmm. I would. I would have been number one every single month had I not bagged sales, which, you know, we're so far removed that I can say that at this point, but I I would bag sales for the next month to help the team with quota. So at the end of the month, I would bag like 15, 20 sales and I would just put them on paper instead of computer and put them in my drawer. Yeah. And so I always fell short of like first every month by like two sales, three sales, you know, and I had really like like 20 in the bank. Exactly. And my managers would always be like, you know, we're not going to give you advice because, you know, bagging them is definitely not with policy and we're not supposed to do that but you can do whatever you think is right you know what i mean and so i would take that and do that and we actually took the company the lifetime club from number 134 to number one in the country in every category from the cafe to the spa to the sales team to everything in a four-month period and i quit that job when they offered me the highest salary that i could i was like 21 and they offered me like 140 grand and i was like okay this is like five months into lifetime like i could probably get rich working here but I felt like I was like capped out mentally already. Like what else am I going to learn? Like how much more it's marginal at this point, you know? So anyways, I quit the same day they gave me the interview and I took a job for 25 K because I wanted knowledge. I wanted to learn. I wanted to challenge myself. I was 21. Like I knew the game. I got it. I mean, I didn't know it. Obviously I still don't know it, but like I got the concept early on of like, you know, I could be 35 and make millions in one year at 35 or at 40. And you know, my whole life's okay. Financially, that's not the problem, but like what person do I need to become to get there? You know what I mean? And so money has never kind of been the motive as long as I have enough to like survive. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've told my wife that from day one that I've been with her, like, I'm not trying to sit here balling out in mansions. We live, you'll see my apartment compared to other people who probably make less money than I do. Transparently, I have, an extremely humble living space. You know what I mean? It's a two bedroom apartment. It's tiny. It's ground level. Like I just don't care, you know, um, because that's not the motive right now. So pretty, just a cool note, you know, from our end of like what people see, what I've seen at least with people that I interview and who are like the actual studs, because the ones that are like a players, they just want to grow. Like growth is the word, whether it's financial, mental, but like there's only so much growth you can have. I feel like mental, physical, spiritual, financial, and I guess those are kind of like covering all the categories. You know what I mean? So if you remove money, the only thing left is like, I mean, I hope no one answers. I want, I hope you pay me in muscle. You know what I mean? Like, so <laughs> physical is removed. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind a little, little extra muscle. A little you know? meat. Little Dude, meat. I see you on your stories. You're, you're killing it. I try to. He's strong. Yeah. Your deadlift is fucking solid. It, it's, it's pretty decent. 
for tea a with the guy. kettlebells for yeah, a man. for a big guy it's good for a little guy it's great yeah you know it's it's one of those things that i take my fitness very seriously um i think health is directly correlated to my ability to be a good husband and a good business owner uh and if i don't can't take care of myself it's like how am i going to take care of other yeah. people uh, yeah and so so many analogies with that yeah, are, you, are you coming at me right now because i'm fat you're not fat. I see you looking down. You're fucking strong, bro. Nah, I'm fat. No, dude, you're strong. <laughs> P-H-A-T. So, yeah, so question then, um, when you were listing all the things about companies that you see and mm-hmm. they don't have an end game, there's one word I was trying to pick at and you said it, it was vision. Mm-hmm. And so I remember when we went to consult with you and the first thing you did, I'm like, okay, what are your books? Like, how are you managing things? And you're like, all right, what is your, um, <laughs> your what, what's your vision with the company and what are your company values? And we're like, who, who is this guy like <laughs> and w- like does he under- not understand why we paid to be here you know what i mean oh, but man, it's it's it. it's crazy because everyone that i pay for high level consulting it's the same question like um other people that i paid in the past you know 15 grand for a day whatever it is i go we talk and then i walk away with a book that says you know company visions and also a list of their company visions and how we should structure our company vision so Elaborate on that a bit because I know you're dealing with a lot of young businesses as well. Yeah. So a lot of them most likely don't have these things. Yeah, I think, you know, s- setting forth like a vision and, and you know, uh, I think where we start with most people is kind of setting like uh, one, their end game, but also like core values within their business. And I think core values have become like this cliche of, of like business to do's. Like you start a business, you put some core values and you post them up on a wall somewhere. But um what a lot of people don't realize is that your core values are your main decision makers within your business. Everything you do, the way you act, the clients that you bring on, the clients that you drop, uh, employees that you hire, fire, promote within your company is all based off of your core values and what you believe. Uh, and so when you have deep rooted core values that you actually live out, you'll be able to make decisions much faster and there'll be less, uh, less indecision within your company of like, is this the right move for our company? Because if you reflect back on your core values and it's like, it's an alignment here, then it's a clear yes. But if it's out of alignment, it's a clear no. And so for me, like we, we never get stagnant uh, in, our, in our direction because we clearly know yes or no, that it's in line with our vision and in line with our core values. And do you feel like most people you talk to don't have those things aligned at all? I, I think some people have an idea and, and, you know, they know what they value, but it's not flushed out with the team. The team is not like aware. It's of never what, been put on paper. It, yeah, it's never been put on paper. And, and on paper doesn't necessarily mean that they're active, right? And mm. so uh, it's actually living them out and it's actually, you know, like reflecting on them on a regular basis and saying, okay, like, hey, we made this decision because it aligned with our core value or it didn't align with our core value. And so whenever I'm having like difficult conversations with employees or, um, you know, I'm going to promote someone, you know, I reflect back on the core values of like, Hey, like, you know, personal happiness, which is one of our core values at our, um, at our company. Um, we're here because we want to be, we always put a little tagline after it, uh, is one of our core values. And so like anytime, like I have to have a very difficult conversation with someone, it reflects it back on, you know, my own personal happiness. Like, I don't want to have this conversation. Like this sucks. And like, Hey, yeah. remember our core value, personal happiness. Well, when you don't complete your job, when you slack off, when you drop the ball, it affects my own personal happiness. And when you can reflect it back on a core value like that, oftentimes people will be like, Oh shoot. Like I never thought of it like that. I better stop what I'm doing or I better do a better job of this. And after I have one of those conversations, I never have one again. Mm. It clicks right away. It's actually pretty incredible. It's crazy because I've been doing this for years and every time it's the same conversation, core values, core values, core values. And I just never really cared until recently. Yeah, <laughs> man. Well, it drives culture, you know? Uh, and, and I think once you reach a certain size and, and a lot of people will not push culture until they're a 20, 25 person team. I see it all the time. Uh, but all of a sudden it's like we have more people to manage and we have to get everyone on the same page moving the same direction. And that's where culture comes in. Right. Uh, you look at, uh, I was just talking to D dang, uh, last night, uh, for a little bit. And he was like, dude, he's like, the only thing that I'm focused on right now is culture. He goes, 
I want the perfect culture fits for our company. I want our culture to be so good that people just feel super weird here if they don't fit within our culture and they, they'll mm. just exit themselves. Uh, and so he's super focused on culture. He's like, once you get to 25, 30 people, he goes, that's the only thing that matters. He's like, that's all I've invested in in the past year is my culture. Uh, and he's like, and, and that's what we continue to push because when you get so large, you need people that think the same way and you need a team that's very in line. So it's important. Yeah. Um, for those that don't know, D Dang has a very successful marketing agency out of Australia, right? Yeah. So he's out of Australia. His whole team is remote, uh, which is, which is wow. crazy because it really speaks to the culture that he's carrying out there. Uh, but the whole team is remote. He's got about 50 ish employees like out of Australia and then another 50 here in the United States. So they actually have split time zones right now. Wow. Um, yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. And so they've been able to keep culture and manage their whole team. Do they overlap hours at all? Um, probably if yeah, you yeah, yeah, I think so. That would so. be fun. It's, it's interesting for sure. So when you, when you were talking about entrepreneurs, you know, most of them just want to get rich, all those things that we we're talking about. I've always considered having a remote team and actually we were fully remote, I guess, before we had an office. Technically everyone was working from their homes for, you know, years, uh, whether it's in other countries or in the same state, like my own business partners who lived a mile down the road were working from their bedroom and I was working from my bedroom, like yeah. as remote as possible. That being said, um, the get rich thing isn't like on my agenda. Um, you know, I'm, Honestly, like I'm, I'm, I don't have hundreds of millions of dollars, but you know, I'm, I'm, I don't worry about that stuff. I just focus on like the company and I get way more fulfillment and way more fun working in an office than I do from a room. Sure. I could be more productive from a room because not everyone's jumping in and pulling on me and telling me things and asking me things and distracting me. So like I know now when I go home and I work from home, I'm super productive that day or two that I'm working from home more than I am maybe in the office, technically speaking. Um, and even team speaking, I jump into people's discords and things like that. And I talk to them, Hey, how's this going? Do you need help more than I am here? But that being said, kind of takes away from the culture that we've created. And so I know a lot of people here that literally like come to my office between me and them and they cry in front of me and they say, this is the best work experience I've ever had. And I look forward to work more than I look forward to going home after work. And so, um, I think that's been a big part of our company as a whole. So like, do you see that at all? Or I know you deal with a lot of remote teams mainly mm -hmm. from the people that I know that you work with. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of remote teams. Um, uh, I think we, we had a very similar culture, uh, at Welling Media when, when we were together, it was a very, uh, you know, active team and, and just love being in the office together. So, um, you know, it, it's definitely all over the place right now. Uh, a lot of teams are remote and, you know, benefit of remote is that you don't pay for an office space, you know? So, um, but overall, like I enjoy having an office space more than I don't, like you just said, um, I would rather be with the team and, you know, show up every day with them and go to battle instead of it being like, Hey, like we're going to chat like in the morning, we'll have like our checkup meeting and then everyone goes and does their thing. Uh, I would much rather be with people, poke my head and manage people from an arm's length instead of over yeah a, over a zoom call or, or discord or whatever yeah. it is you know i mean it's like there's so many tools now you can do it but it's kind of like yeah of course you can like live life without one eye or you know yeah. something like that but it's like yeah but i'd rather have two you know what i mean yeah. like i mean how you, much can, more, you can how much more do you laugh in this office space compared to just like working remote i don't know if you guys went remote at any point in time during i mean COVID. eddie had surgery a couple weeks ago so he was out of the office well, I mean, like even during COVID, in december one person in the office got COVID, and a bunch of people yeah, got it and yeah. we went remote for like two weeks straight Yeah, and like how much did you like laugh at your home office compared, not com nearly as yeah, much compared to being yeah. here you know like and, and that's what i love about having like a in-person seems like forever experience is, sorry no you're good man um is like the team camaraderie the laughter you know, for sure. And it's like, honestly, you're probably not as productive being here, but I don't know. It makes work more enjoyable. It makes waking up every day a little bit more enjoyable. And you know, that you're going somewhere where, you know, you'll have friends and people that you, uh, that you really drive with, you know? Yeah. It's just like, for me, it gives me more of a sense of fulfillment and, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. I have software companies. I have two software companies with three different softwares underneath them. And those are fully remote. You know, 100% I've 
never seen the person, the people that I work with in person actually. So that's how remote it is. Um, and it's cool and they're productive and we get stuff done and you know, we don't waste time and we're moving every single week. We're moving the needle. That being said, you know, I don't like jump up and down waking up in the morning to like go build those softwares. You know what I mean? Yeah. But here I'm like, okay, like people are depending on me and this person, you know, I know a lot like, yeah, sure. Remote. I could know a lot about people's personal lives. It's just like different when they can just come like step into my office physically and like break down crying in front of me instead of like a zoom call. You know what I mean? It's just like, just doesn't hit the same. So for me, you know, I'm not saying remote is not the way because right now we're hiring remote aggressively, like literally like nine remote to one in office, but that's because we just like don't have space. Like we have space for like three or four more people in this office probably. And it's kind of the same reason why we, you know, really made a huge push to e-com versus like in-person businesses, physical businesses. Cause a lot of these businesses, like we were maxing them out. Like they couldn't even take more appointments cause they're physical businesses. Like they'd need a whole nother place to grow. Whereas these e-com businesses, they're just shipping stuff to people all over the world. Same with us. Like we can max out this office as much as possible. We can only expand so many more offices over, um, and with remote, I mean, we can scale way easier and faster and stuff, but it's just a, a trade off. Yeah. And w- honestly, like we would lose clients because we did too good and they would be like booked out for like two months and they'd be like, we're going to pause and come back in two months. So we would be like punishing ourselves for doing such a good job. It's yeah. like, okay, let's just shift over to an industry that can just like <laughs> keep selling more, <laughs> you know, like it shouldn't be that hard. We're uh, yeah. You're, you know, you're doing well when they're turning off ads. Cause like the ads are working too good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like we don't need more leads. <laughs> so from, from an operation standpoint, you know, uh, vision, all these things aside, um, where do you feel like most people are, are just kind of lacking after they've established a business? Um, I'd love to talk about, cause like, I feel like the people you deal with are people who have income coming in, but are a freelancer more adjusting into growing into a company. And then you have the other group of people that you deal with that are like, companies that are trying to go from like, you know, 30 employees to a hundred employees. You know what I mean? I feel like, is that kind of correct? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, I mean the one thing that everyone's missing is essentially like some sort of like system game plan of how they're going to get from where they're at now to where they're going within the next two years. So if you have a, a goal for 25, 50, 25 to 50 employees, you need a game plan to get there just like a revenue goal. It's like, you need to reverse engineer that and and have the ability to be like, okay, what does it look like next year? What does it look like in two years down the road? And so a lot of what I do with companies is what I call like process org charting. And we build it out for exactly how they are now. And the smaller companies, the CEO or or the founder is 100% 100 in the fulfillment of their company. And so my goal with them is, okay, let's take you and let's get you a path to get out of fulfillment So you can just make decisions within the company. And and essentially what I tell people is like, there's three levels of business. Level one, you are doing all the labor and you're making all the decisions. Level two, you're delegating a lot of labor, but you're still making decisions within the business. And then level three, you delegate labor and big decisions. decisions. Uh, And like the biggest decisions you probably still have a hand in, but you have like a C-level team that will, that you can delegate to that will, you know, they will make tough decisions without you even being there because chances are like when you bring on like a CMO or when you bring on a COO, your my hope at least is that they're better than me at that specific position. And so if they're better than me, they have 100% authority to go and make that decision. For and, sure. And so when we're breaking those pieces down, it's where are we at now and where are we trying to go and what positions are we, we going to need to fill and how do we take the person that's in fulfillment there now, whether that's the CEO or or someone that needs to be at a higher level position, how do we move them out of that position and get them out of fulfillment? And so that's what I help people like build a vision for is like, okay, one year, here's our process chart. Okay. Year two, this is what it looks like. And we slowly start to remove them from those pieces. And then once we have a good idea of like what their process org chart looks like, we'll go in and we'll actually build the physical system. So it's like, you know, onboarding process. Like we'll take the onboarding block and be like, okay, let's break this down. What does it look like to onboard a client for this specific service? And then we actually go and 
break down those systems. And what's the hardest part of going from one person to five people, in your opinion? Because I feel like that's the toughest thing, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I just think it's like two things. One, your mental block that quality is going to drop if it's not you. That's exactly what I was Giving up say. the control. Giving up the control will 100% because you're going to be afraid that people are going to drop the ball, and they will. It'll happen. It's 100% going to happen. Yeah, and you just have to be... You have to be okay with it. Um, yeah. And as they drop the ball, like, you don't just, like, let them drop the ball. You you jump in and you educate them. And you're like, hey, this is why we lost, but this is how we win in the future. Mm-hmm. And that's the expectation moving forward. Yeah. And I think the other the other big one is, you know, giving up the control but also splitting the pie. You know, hiring exactly. more people, you're, you're giving up a portion of your money. <laughs> yeah. And when That's you, the other aspect of it. And when you combine those two, it's a very, very tough mental block. To one, one of the biggest things I remember Eddie and I had a conversation one time and you, you mentioned to me that, you, you know, you're like, dude, I could make way more money than I'm paying myself right now in this business. If I was just freelancing or consulting at this point, you know what I mean? But yeah. like, I want to build something special. Like I want to build something sick. And I was like, Oh shit. Like I, I, it like it really clicked for me in that minute because I was like, oh, yeah, he totally could take on like seven, ten, twenty clients on his own, be making way more. But it's like, how fun is that? Just doing it yourself. And yeah, I mean, way more way more fun to build something with people, and like that's what's exciting for me too. For I sure. I mean, transparently speaking, I like, and I've told you this, I already still do consulting on the side and, you know, for, for people that want to, for the most part, people that pay for a one hour call a week, I charge between five to 10 K depending on what they want. And that's monthly. So like break it out per call, you're talking 1250 to 2,500 per call. And these people think it's worth a hundred times more than what it is because I'm literally coming in as like a one hour per week CEO and telling the CEO and everyone on this team what to do. And it just moves the needle so much faster. And so from a monetary standpoint, yes, working alone, 100%, I would make, I, I would make, I could easily make right now, in my opinion, half of what Form Media is making as an entire company working by myself from a computer at home and just taking on freelancing and consulting gigs with ease. But would we have a TV show? Would we have a podcast? Would we have all these other things that we're creating? Would we have a team? Would we have people that come so happy that they left their old job to work here? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's Some, like legacy shit too, you know? Big time, dude. We're, we're just getting started, man. And in, in, in three years, we're going to look back and be like, wow. Everyone's going to be like, where did these guys come from? Yeah. yeah. You never know. You're the good old days until you're past them, you know? Yeah. Right it's now, like the these, good old days are, are six months ago. I know, right? <laughs> Literally, when we were all in there. Yeah. Next time I'm trying to get on this podcast, it'll be like a, a three-year booking. I'll not be able to get on <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right? Like, yeah, we'll, we'll need to book you six yeah, months out, Josh. Yeah, Josh, sorry, man. Like, uh. We'll have to do that next year. We're sque- we get. I mean, we're we're squeezing you in between the rock yeah. and uh, <laughs> and yeah, he, Joe Rogan. Just you know, he's begging us. So, yeah. yeah so. <laughs> but but really though, it just creates. It's just way different. I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because that's that's. I mean, you've been here for a while. That's how I operate, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Like, it's not like I'm just saying that to get you in the door. Yeah, and I know for me personally, like when I I kind of realize this about myself, like the people that I'm like building things with and working with are like typically the people that are like my closest friends at the time you know what i mean like it's it's weird because there's certain friends that will hit me up you know that i haven't talked to in a long time and it's like yo we should grab dinner and whatever it's like dude like i i hate to break it to you but like i don't even have dinner with like even my closer closer friends that i'm not working with because like i'm just like building shit and focused on like you know it's i mean everything is a balance it's like i've seen like a triangle of like social life work uh you know working at gym, like health and fitness and so it's like pick two you know what i mean <laughs> but but like a lot of times i feel like i'm i i try to be in environments where the people that i am working with that kind of is like a part of my social life you know what yeah. i mean like i'm homies with like a lot of people here now like eddie and i have become super close since working here like it's it's kind of a cool thing and i think a lot of people take that for granted if they have it and don't even realize that's a thing if they don't have it. Like they can't imagine like a place that they like really love going to work. You know, I'm sure you guys feel the same, but like right now, like I, for the last few years, at least the people that I keep around in my life are the ones that understand that seeing each other four times a year is a lot. Like Mm -hmm. it's not, not, not like they look at it as like, Oh my God, I'm hanging out too much with this guy. But it's like, 
if you can just appreciate that like we can hang out once a month or once every two or three months and like our relationship doesn't you know falter because of that it actually grows and we appreciate those moments and we spend that time together those are the people i've kept around more because if you think about it like let's just say you have like you know your top 20 friends if you hung out with them each once a month you would literally have like one day to yourself a month exactly you know what i mean so it's like it's physically impossible and i have friends that you know right now one of my one of my groomsmen at my wedding i literally haven't like talked to him since my wedding two months ago like maybe one text or two texts but he'll probably fly up here in two weeks and nothing as if like le- yesterday i got married you know what i mean yeah. and those are kind of people you look for at this point in life i feel like 100 percent. yeah i I've, I've even noticed something very similar in like my circle like my circle just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller and like a few of my friends understand what i'm trying to do sorry a few of my friends know exactly hey. what i'm trying to do um but like i've lost a few friends from just falling out of contact and it's like you know it is what it is at the end of the day um but you know, for me, like the two things that I make sure that I have in check are my health and then family. It's like, those are the two things, like not willing to lose that over the business. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, the, the friend circle, it's like the ones that understand it, they'll stick around, you know, but the ones that don't understand it, like they've, they've already gravitated somewhere else. Cool. So a question on fitness this is important because it's kind of like a very hot topic. Yep. Um, you, you stay fit, you know, you already got a girl. I do. You know, you're married. Married. Right. So you already got that. Dogs. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> and and gentlemen. And, and men. Yeah. 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 <laughs> let's, let's be inclusive here. Yep. Um, so you're already married. Um, you're not you're not competing in any CrossFit competitions or anything like that. Nope. You're not, you know, competing in sports. So why do you choose to stay so fit? Um, you know, for me, uh, I think a lot of it plays off of anxiety. Um I do not get anxious when I work out, but mm. the day I stop working out, my anxiety ramps up like 200%. Do you it, feel like that's because you're thinking about you're getting fat because you're not working out, for example? No, 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 no. no I think it's, um, keeps that like inner chatter in check kind of. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, for me, it's, it's, it really, I think it comes down to like, you know, business is, is stressful at the end of the day. It's like, you know, um, there's a lot of things that are dependent on me now and so when that when you kind of like get into that mindset I don't know I just feel like fitness is my avenue to release stress and release anxiety like a lot of people do like therapy or yoga like fitness is my therapy or yoga Uh, and so for me uh, I just enjoy going to like like, it's like a ritualistic too. Yeah. You go in the mornings, you wake up, you start your day. Yep. Yeah. It, it really helps me clear a lot of my brain fog in the morning as well. So I'm just more alert. Like my coaching calls are 10 times better when I work out. Like I can tell a huge difference in the energy that I'm able to bring when I work out in the morning versus when I don't work out in the morning. Like my mental fog is completely gone by the time I hit my first call. Okay. So I don't disagree with that, but let me spin the question again. Mm-hmm. That's you working out. Yep. That's not necessarily you being strict on your diet and staying yeah. in shape. Like I work out, I mean, don't get me wrong. I've been out for two months now, over two months because of my surgery and my wedding. But prior to that, I worked out every day. I was still weighing 275 pounds. I was still a fat dude, but I was like super strong working out every day, not missing a day. Yeah. So, you know, I guess that's kind of the disconnect here. So like, um, are you saying like more on the nutrition side, like on the holistic side of the approach? Like for example, I work out every day. Mm -hmm. It's my way, you know, let's just pretend, you know, two months ago I work out every day. It's my way of one, you know, waking up and starting the day strong. And I carry that momentum throughout the day. That's for sure. But even when I don't work out in the morning, I work out at night and it's kind of my way of like not letting myself get fat, but like also staying big, you know what Mm -hmm. I mean? So that people are like, Oh, he definitely works out like looking good. You know what I mean? And that, and I didn't have any like super hard motivation when I was in college, you know, it was girls. I was like, dude, if I just can get an eight pack senior year, then like I can pull any bitch I want, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? And, (laughs) and and don't get me wrong. And and that motivation was strong enough (laughs) because I was like, I'm fat my whole life. Let me prove that I can do it and do this. And as I got like halfway there, I noticed, you know, female attention was a lot stronger. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to keep going. And I drilled down and got like an eight pack. I've been fat my whole life. My entire family's fat cousins, everything like everyone's fat. So that was my motivation. I got there. And then once I got there, I was like, okay, what now? You know what I mean? And I kind of just faded from there. So like, what is it that just keeps you 
holistically healthy at all times. There's got to be something that just like, I can't let this go. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. That's a great question. I, I put a lot of value into my health and I like, I, can't, I don't know if I can like pinpoint like a specific reason why, um, you know, uh, both of my grandparents died at a very early age, like to things that were very preventable. Um, I think one had a stroke and then the other one had a heart attack and like that stuff's so preventable. Like you just stay healthy and, and exercise. And then were they, were they obese, overweight or not, not, really? not too bad. Just, just weak, you mm-hmm. know? Um, yeah, not, not a lot of muscle on them, you know, uh, you know, didn't, didn't really pay attention to their heart health at all. Um, so, you know, it wasn't that they were obese by any means, but you know, yeah, they died at an early age because in my opinion, they just didn't exercise. Didn't on a prioritize basis. their health. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And like, I don't want to like, you know, they, they died pretty young, like in their sixties, um, which, yeah. which is like way too early. So you know, I think that's part of the reason that I really prioritize it. Um, the other part is like just athleticism, you know, uh, I love being active and I love playing sports. And so like when I go out and, um, and, and actually compete, like I don't, I don't want to be the guy that's like the last picked or, uh, the person on the team that's like, okay, like we can't give him the ball or <laughs> whatever it is because it's like <laughs> he's, he's, he's not very good. Like I want to be one of the most athletic people on the court. I want to compete at the highest level. Like Although, like, I'm not incredible at sports, like, I'll hold my own in almost every sport that I play outside of hockey. I cannot play hockey. I'm brutal. But everything else, like, that's why I'm, like, stoked to be here this weekend because, like, Eddie and I, we have plans to go play basketball, I think, on Saturday and then Sunday flag football. And it's like, yeah, like, like I never played football growing up, but I can go out there and compete because I'm probably faster than most people uh, that, that are out there. And so, and I can catch, so... It's funny because I'm like, I'm like the exact opposite of that. I like don't care at all about playing like recreational sports. For me, it's like, uh, like the longevity thing. Like you said, Mm. like I definitely, I just don't want to be that old guy. That's like, fuck, I wish I would have just like taken care of my body. Like you only have one body. And I like looking good too. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, yeah, I I don't, I don't want to like look bad. Yeah. You got to send a few mirror selfies to your wife. You look you look great, dude. I look okay. You look great. Round. You look great. Not gonna lie, from from like videos and stuff from like this winter, like December and stuff, you look a lot better. Really? Yeah, for wow. sure. Well, like, because I was looking back on like some old videos and shit, and for sure, like especially, I know the wedding was like a huge motivator. But you're like strong, big, you know. Like, yeah, it, it, I almost got really in shape for the wedding, but then I tore my hamstring like six weeks before, and it destroyed me. It was fucking I. Yeah. So. I don't know. And like, honestly, like sex is better when you're in really great shape. Um, it's like, I want to have, you know, I don't know if this is too much information. For no, this no, podcast, no, but, no, no, uh, no, no. But I'm like, I want to have great sex with my wife for the longest time. And I think part of that is both of us being physically fit. Hundred yeah. percent. You know, that's a good point. You know, and it's like, I don't know, like people that have sex longer are happier longer. Um, like I don't, never want to like look at my marriage and be like, yeah, I just don't want to have sex anymore. Like, mm. oh, what a bummer that would be. Yeah, yeah, sounds like a chore. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I had a, I had kind of like an epiphany, like I don't know, like ten days ago. Um, I was just like sitting. I, uh, I had like two hours of sleep, and I dropped off Terry, my wife, at the airport at like five a.m. I got to the office at like six, and you know, two hours of sleep. I'm like, I can't operate like that, honestly. So luckily, we have a bed. <laughs> so I unlocked all the doors, and then I went to sleep till like eight forty. Um, just to kind of get some rest and catch up. And while I was laying in bed, for some reason, like I got not tired when I laid down as always. Um, so like I opened up my phone and someone asked me for like a specific video from like years ago. And I knew the only place I saved it was Snapchat. So I went through Snapchat and I was like in like 2016 and I was like, damn, like I look really good here. Like not like I'm not talking abs. I'm talking like in clothes. You know what I mean? Like my face looks better. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, don't even look like this person anymore. And it's not because I age. It's because I got fat. Like, that's the only reason. And like, if I could look like this, I'd be like, I was attracted to myself looking. I'm like, damn, like, this is a good looking guy. You know what I mean? And then I look at <laughs> yeah, the yeah. I'm like, not the same. So, but in that moment, you know, cause my motivation isn't there. Like it was in college. I was like, yo, we're spring break. Let's get ripped for spring break. You know what I mean? Like I'm eating eggs and it's cool because like your friends are seeing you change and it's like this big deal. And it's like, damn, Eddie's getting shredded yeah. and like people in class, people at the bars. So, but I had this epiphany kind of like 
you're kind of mentioning it the same way, just like not as direct. Like I felt like I could just win at everything better yeah. if I was in better shape. I'm not saying like I need a raging eight pack and need to do CrossFit competitions, yeah. but like if I just took care of myself and it, it would take like two months, three months of giving up like fast food completely and like staying in my lane a little yeah. bit better, a little bit of cardio and I can get to like, right now I'm like 280. If I can get to like 230, 235, I'm like really in good shape at that point. Even 220, I'm like extremely in good shape. So I'm trying to get there, but like 235 to start. I say all this to say, I noticed I would win at everything. So my relationship would be better, right? My wife would be more attracted to me, likely, you know, I would hope so at that point. <laughs> um, but sex would be better for sure. You know, experience that from the beginning of our relationship to now, even just me gaining weight definitely has an effect. I would win more at sports. I would win more uh, on being on videos, which I'm a lot more of now. I would win more at conferences. I would just look better and I would, you know, it would impact my life from a winning perspective, not just from a, Oh, Eddie looks good perspective. Cause for me, Eddie looks good. Wasn't enough. It's, mm -hmm. it's just not enough for me to go that hard. And your body's a lot different than mine. So like you'll probably get a lot leaner than I can quickly. If we're at the same weight, mm -hmm. like you would get leaner quicker and I would get bigger quicker than you. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like my body's just so extreme on that side. So like getting to the weight that and I like needed to do more for whatever the body types. Yeah. Are. But like on the extreme end, yeah, like yeah, it took sure. me nine months straight of like, never having a cheat meal and like always hitting like two hours of stairmasters in the morning and waking up at five and then doing double time workout like double workouts every day and like nine months of that to get to where my body was yeah and i like to do all that i just don't have motivation again but like to get halfway there yeah. you know i realized that's enough for me to win and everything and that's kind of what's triggered in my head and now i mean sure it's only two weeks in from the day that i've kind of recognized that but even in the last like six months or let's call it a year since my wife has moved here from California. I have not had two weeks straight without like a single bad meal. And at least, you know, I've kind of made track on that. And even her, she's like, let's go get here. Let's go get here. I'm like, no, we agreed to this. That's yeah. not happening. And so for me, it was winning. Man, if, if I could give like anybody advice on fitness, uh, and, and having my degree in exercise science, I'm allowed to do this. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's a couple of things, a couple of things. Uh, one being strong is, super undervalued uh people think that they need to step on a stair master for two hours to lose fat i my workouts are maybe 30 minutes and in, in, in my opinion some of the least intense workouts um possible i just lift big muscle groups and i lift decently heavy like not like nothing too crazy like i i'm past the days of like i'm lifting uh you know one rep maxes and stuff like I, i'm that's just ego lifting at that point yeah, exactly. it's not doing anything it's just for the number on the exactly on the brain but like making like this huge disturbance in your body and, and doing like hyper hyper hypertrophic training um will allow you to break down muscle and the recovery time that it takes for you to repair that muscle burns so many more calories than you just and stair master getting on a stair master yeah. and walking for two hours 100%. and so doing those things and like just lift heavy, move weights, pick things up, crawl around. Like that's, that's what my training is all about is like, dude, I'll just like pick up like this, there's this massive sandbag at lifetime fitness, it's 80 pounds and I'll just bear hug it and I'll just walk in circles and, and, and walk laps. And it's like, some primitive shit. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> it um, really is though. You know, it, it's, like it's like farmer strength, far, farmer strength. That's what it yeah. is, man. Like it, whenever you see farmers, it's like why they're always in good old boys. Yep. Yeah, in in yeah, decent yeah. shape. Um, <laughs> And then on the nutrition side, man, like if you can watch what you drink, consuming your calories through like a liquid form is terrible. It, it's not, it's it. not that it's bad. It's just, it adds up so fast. It's so many totally. extra calories. So like finding like those zero calorie drinks and I'm sure I'll tilt some people by saying this, but like artificial fl like flavors and sugars and stuff, like you're going to be fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to die from that. Um, and then on the like eating side it's like just don't overeat like eat until you're satisfied and then roll like those are like my only rules I, I don't limit any foods for myself i eat whatever i want whenever i want if i'm hungry i eat when i'm satisfied i'm done and like, yep. if you do those things you will stay lean it's totally. just a little bit of like extra self-control and like understanding some very basic principles like my other rule is like i have like i eat protein at every meal yeah you know it's like that's it. That's all I focus on. I don't count and macros. I don't, I don't count micronutrients. Like 
there's I, I think for for some people like having a period in your life where you do religiously count your calories is mm-hmm. great because then you get an understanding of like oh i'm looking at this plate of chicken like i understand yeah on a on a broader level like oh this is the about this much protein and this much co- uh, calories but i don't need to put it on a fucking scale yeah. and track it in my app to yeah. like know that you 100%, know 100 percent, 100 percent. i completely agree with that um like educate yourself on nutrition and say, yeah. like, okay what's appropriate for my body and what's a, and what's appropriate to just stay at the level because it's like you know calories calories in is is the only reason why you're going to yeah. gain or lose you know yep Cal- you know but anyways i mean fun I'm, stuff i'm glad to hear that we're all on the same page get for sure get fit and that will definitely affect so your do you performance do, do you have have you set a goal for yourself like an actual 235 uh, 235 but yeah. are you do you have a date or anything or is uh, it just like uh, get there it's I guess that's the problem here, right? Yeah. I gave myself kind of three months, but it's not like I'm ticking it on a clock and like watching it. There's one thing that um, my uh, my friend helped me with at one point. Uh, so like a couple of years ago, I wanted to set like a fitness goal of some kind. And for a lot of people, that's either like a bodybuilding competition or, you know, like something that's like going to motivate you. And so you got to kind of like go into your own brain and figure out like, is it humiliation that's going to motivate you? Is it like some, you know, something else? Mm-hmm. So what um, she told me, to, I was like, cause I don't want to do like a bodybuilding competition or something. It's just not my thing. But um, I, I scheduled a really expensive photographer to do a fitness photo shoot mm. at a certain time. I'm not saying that's necessarily what you need to do, but that was one thing that like super motivated me because I knew there was a date on the calendar. I was paying a lot of money and w- when the photos come out, I'm going to want to post them and stuff like that. So I like, it was like multiple levels of like motivation yeah. for me to hit my goal by like a certain date. Mm. And that was like a, that, that worked really well. So I feel like in general, if you can kind of like, force it yeah because i'm so bad like if i'm just setting a deadline for myself i'll let myself down all the time but if it's for someone else that's when it's like for me personally that's that's what really like motivates me so there's got to be some sort of like external Mm -hmm. factor too that was me for my wedding but then you know injuries came and surgeries and that kind of derailed it but yeah or or a vacation you know like getting like you know you're like okay i'm gonna go to the beach i want to be like jack for the beach or whatever i don't know but anyways. again, remember my intrinsic motivator is not looking good. It's like, yeah, it's kind of like winning and being winning. on video yeah, and exactly. no, but you're totally right. Cause like now we're so much on video and things like that. Even, uh, cause I like uh, intentionally was like bulking back in like early, early part of this year. And even then, like I'm looking at myself on videos and pictures and stuff. I'm like, damn, <laughs> I was a little bit chubby or definitely yeah, like yeah. in the face and everything. Yeah, for sure. But, so that Anyways. being said, we kind of got to wrap this up. Um, I got two questions that I want to close with. Sure. One, um, <laughs> one, if you could give advice, one piece of advice, one sentence, one, I don't want to limit you one sentence, but one piece of advice to one letter people who are, you know, starting out in business, <laughs> yeah. starting out, um, in, you know, their actual professional careers, what would it be to focus on? Like, what would the one thing you would just give like your son at the age of like 23, 24? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think the one one piece of advice I'd give to to anyone is be a servant. Um, it's something that I've I've leaned heavily into is trying to serve other people, and you know, at, especially at the beginning uh, when you're just getting started and trying to get your foot in the door and build the relationships. It's all about how you can serve other people. Uh, I made a post today. It was like it's something that I've been hearing across some of the the bigger entrepreneurs that are in my circle and people that are doing very well for themselves is. Uh, they'll always end conversations like, how can I help you? How can I serve you? And uh, I think if you can get into that mindset of like, instead of like, what's in it for me? Like, what's in it for we? I think uh, that's, um, what's it? Tony Robbins is, is like really big on that. Like, it's not about me, it's about we. Uh, and so, you know, uh, man, like it's so true. Like if you just focus on serving people, like you'll win um, and you'll build great relationships with the people that you need to build relationships with. So that'd be like the number one thing. Cool. And then number two, um, I know you've personally, you know, helped us with our business and you've been a part, big part of like why we've scaled and, you know, I've even given you testimonial videos on it and things like that. But, um, w- like where would someone find you to connect with you? Where's the best place to connect one? And, uh, two, you know, 
Is there anything that you can sell them that would help them in their professional career? And I also want to tack onto that the yeah. two second story of why your username is Joshi Kobayashi. Okay, yeah. So <laughs> so you can uh, you can find me on Instagram Joshi Kobayashi. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm getting I'm getting heavy into the Twitter game, guys. It's that's good. It's where yeah. the direct to consumer people uh-huh. are. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. So you can find me there. I have a Facebook as well. I have a website three two one pocketops dot com. Um, Joshi Kobayashi uh, came in at Welling Media. It was my nickname at Welling Media. Um, and it was given to me by Chandler Welling uh, when we played ping pong, actually. And so whenever we would play ping pong, you would call me Joshi Kobayashi. And I don't know why, but... Uh, Isn't Kobayashi the competitive eater? I think so. Like the... Hot yeah, eater yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I thought it yeah. had something to do with. No, so I think... Uh, I mean, it rhymes. And, and I thought you were just gobbling glizzies. Y- yeah, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> pretty decent at that, too. Um, so we would always play ping pong and I was, I was the best in the office. Let's be honest. Um, of and course. yeah. And so I don't know. It was just a nickname that I'd slap he gave me. Joshi Kobayashi. I mean, we need a ping pong table here. You guys don't have a, you guys are an agency and you have a ping pong table. Yeah. We just only have, you know, podcast studios, psych sure. walls, like, you know, yeah, okay. set, we can set up so. a little net here and it could be like the ping pong, the ping pong podcast, the ping pong podcast, the ping, the ping podcast. Uh, uh, that doesn't really work. The it, ping pong, the cast. ping pong pod. And Welcome anyways, to the Pongcast. Yeah, the Pongcast. So that's the Kobayashi story. Um, and then, as far as like, if I have something to sell people, it, it depends if you're if you're a good listener or not. If you're not mm. good at taking advice, I don't I don't want to I don't want to work with you. It's so. not going to be a good fit. Yeah, it's not going to be a good fit at all. But, but if they, they made do. it to the end of this podcast, they're probably a pretty decent listener because that's yeah. all they had to do. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, we we have programs that we run. They're all ninety day programs. Um, we have group programs. We have one on one consulting. That's it. We have we have a few offers. Um, and it's a, uh, creative agencies or is it freelancers too? Yeah. So, uh, we have one creative agency offer where we actually help you build out a creative team. Um, and we call it the million dollar creative team. So essentially what that creative team will be able to do is, uh, be able to s- sustain up to a million dollars. And I think it'll do more, but at least a million dollars in revenue for your company. Um, it's not like we implement it and it just generates you a million dollars, but, uh, it has the opportunity to build to a million dollar revenue stream for your agency and then the other two are more like broad agency so if you own some sort of digital agency we have a group program and a one-on-one program uh one of them's called three to one foundation that's the group program and then uh agency launch program is our one-on-one program and both of those are more for like uh business foundation and building out the right systems for your business oh yeah and they come highly recommended for me personally definitely that's for coming sure. from previous i mean we're, we've worked with you in the past and it's yep. been amazing. So cool. we, we highly recommend Josh. Cool. Josh, thank you so much, dude, for driving yeah. down here, making this trip for this podcast. And great. thank you to everyone listening. We'll see you on the next episode. Peace. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Four Media Uncut podcast. If you want to work with us, learn with us, or even join the team and be a part of what we're doing at Four Media Marketing, just go to our website. It's fourmedia.marketing, no.com, no.net, dot marketing, because that's all we do around here. And most importantly, share this with a friend wherever you're listening to or watching this on. Please hit that share button, send it over to a friend, someone else that you think will get value out of this. It would mean the world to us. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you like this video and comment down below any suggestions for future guests. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, please rate this five stars and leave us a review there. That helps us tremendously in the algorithm world. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you on the next episode of 4Media Uncut Podcasts.